if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> it's always a gamble, you know how it works. But I think we are up and running. Let's see. Okay, let me know in the comments quickly if everyone in the chat, if everything is uh, good, if you can hear me loud and clear and all sorts of things, right? You know how it goes. And then I think we can get started already. Like I didn't have, um, I, I want to go, obviously I've been working with uh, Render Man for, uh, for quite some time in the past um, in all my productions and uh, on personal projects as well. Clear, that's good, thank you. Um, but I never on my YouTube channel work with Render Man just, just because I was using this in production all the time. Hey, just three things, how's it going? And I thought it's time maybe to focus a little bit more on Random Man just because it gets more popular, more people are starting to use it in a more um, personal sense. And because it was also so production heavy, I just thought I'd, I'd probably give a quick insight. Um, and I will be using Houdini most of the time. Um, today I want to show Llama shading networks, I want to show a little bit of pixel surface, how you can do shaders. It will be fairly straightforward, but in a sense of, on the Houdini side. Um, and then in later videos I will, I'm planning to do, I will definitely go into more detail, I will use effects stuff and all, all funny things together. Um, but I said for today it's more like an introduction um, just to show you what I, what, how I work with Random Man, and at some point in the future, I will probably jump onto the Blender train as well because it gets so popular. More and more people are developing and plugins for it. I will be showing how to uh, properly do VFX production ready assets in Blender at some point. But for now, we will be focusing on Random Man. This is my main DCC for now, and that is pretty much all I want to say. <laughs> Rexy, that's fine. Um, that's totally fine. So I have my Stream Deck thing enabled, so let's just uh, switch to my desktop here. So as you can see, quite typically, I do have the Pixar Teapot, which is um, like the brand image for Random Man or for Pixar in general. Um, and this is like a model I downloaded from their website, so nothing too crazy. Um, a few things to know, you can't just hit render um, with Render Man, you obviously need to install all this, all this stuff first, but it always needs a render camera. So if you just hit render, um, it, that won't work out of the box. So what I did right now, I just have the teapot in here. You can see the topology, it's very low in subdivisions and we'll be trying to do that at render times. So I'm just creating here a quick out null. Let's just do that. Uh, rename this to just out. Like that. And this would now be if I control click on, on the view thing here, I can also make this directly my render object. So let's just jump out of this. And you can see I have nothing in the scene. It's quite uh, straightforward, everything. Um, so the first thing obviously what you want to do is create a camera. So I'm going to the lights tab here where the camera is. Control clicking it will create a camera from the current view. Then I lock my view and I can navigate and change my um, orientation or whatever. Uh, and let's just uh, stay with this one. What I always like to do, I want to set my um, focus plane so I always have a nice uh, depth of field because Random Man is really good with depth of field, really fast. So all you got to do is um, right click your camera until you get the manipulator working. Sometimes it's a bit weird. I'm not sure exactly. Sometimes, yeah, you need to get this, these handles, and then there's this um, focus handle, and then you can move this thing, which is your focal point, and then move it where you want to have focus. And then these two handles are how shallow your depth of field are. So if it's very narrow, it's very uh, out of focus, there's lots of blur behind it. If it's very large, your focal, um, your depth of field region, then it's very sharp. But I want it to be very shallow, like this maybe. Um, so that's set up. If I go back to my camera view, boom. And um, the cool thing is the integration of uh, Render Man in Houdini is pretty good. Like everything works very well. You can create your materials, your render um, interactivity is very fast. So you will see in a bit how fast it really is. So um, let me just save the scene as my um, temp here quick. 
So let's just go to test. I'm just saving it as a new one. Let's call this just a live RFH. RFH stands for random man for Houdini. Oh, so this is now saved. And first you want to assign the material. So you just select your object, go to your random man shelf and you click pixel surface. This automatically assigns the material, creates a pixel surface and its network within it. So all I got to do now is maybe rename this to base. And the beauty of uh, Pixar or Random Man is that they, they have VFX in mind. Everything is um, pretty much um, already set up automatically. It uses 18% neutral gray color tones for your base material. And all these things are very important um, for VFX because you need to, to have a neutral environment. And, and Random Man is just set up out of the box like that, which is uh, pretty epic. And then we don't have a light. So what you want to do as well, you can click on your um, dome light, control click, creates a dome light in the center of your scene. I probably don't want to display it in the viewport, so I'm just toggling that off. And I do want to select a, uh, a texture, so you have a color map. I do have a preset for my studio light, which automatically um, fills that in. You can see that is filled in. And you can also set the color space to sRGB linear. Make sure you have um, OCIO installed with ACES, so everything is set up uh, not very nicely. Um, and then I probably want to rotate it. It's also nice the the lighting is represented in the viewport as well. So you when whenever I rotate it, you will see it's actually updating in the viewport as well, which is also very nice. It's a very nice um, touch to this. Um, all right, so we have a shader, we have a camera, we have a light. So what do we need? Still, we still need to tell Houdini and what it wants to render. Right on default, it it will always fall back to Mantra if nothing is installed. Um, let's see. Uh, based on your experience, do you think RenderMan 24 is the fastest CPU render? Um, I'm asking because I will use it for personal projects. Um, it is fast. I Obviously, you need to do your render tests yourself to see what is the fastest or whatever, but it is a fast render engine for sure. All right, so as I said, we need to have a render output. So it's called a um, R24 RUP. You just click that, it creates you a RIS um, render output. It has the default path tracer in it. So this is the integrator, which is essentially the algorithm, how the race will be calculated. It's called an integrator. Uh, Random Man has several integrators, which is pretty nice. You have a VCM integrator, which is a bi-directional path tracer, uh, all sorts of things. Um, XPU is only for um, yeah commercial projects. So you need to have a valid um, Random Man license to run XPU. I do have one, so I'll be showcasing XPU as well. The limitation is it only works for uh, Pixar Surface, so no Llama support on RIS, uh, sorry, on XPU. All right, so RIS is there, Path Tracer is there. Path Tracer is the, the default. Uh, I think it's just a unidirectional Path Tracer with your BXDF, light samples, inner examples. Nothing too crazy. Russian roulette sampling is in there as well, which is pretty nice. Um, hitting save, and then I'm just going to hit IPR render. This should open up um, it, which is um, the default, um, I think it's called image viewer image imaging tool and you see this is now loaded up and this is now my it render window you can also render natively in uh, houdini's render view but it has so much more functionality which is uh, pretty nice um, it automatically has in-house denoising so by hitting n you can see maybe if i zoom in a little you, this is the raw noise if i hit n it just gets rid of that noise so this is built in in um, it and obviously as i said before the integration is pretty nice. If I now rotate my lights, you will see it's updating pretty much on the fly. It is denoising on the fly and it is rendering on the fly as well. You can always hit N to disable denoising, which will give you an even faster feedback. So that's pretty nice. It's a really cool integration. And you can see it's pretty jagged, right? It's not subdivided at all. So things, uh, what you need to do to get that up and running is um, you need to assign some kind of random man attributes on your on your objects on default it doesn't have much so what you want to do select your um, geo nodes in houdini and you just say um, add spare parameters and this will give you this random man tab and this will give you all the functionality for um, subdivisions for visit uh, for render visibilities and all sorts of things um, only for commercial Oh yeah, this, this live stream will always be on my channel, so you can always go back in time and watch it again. Also, if you like this, what I'm doing right now, I would highly appreciate if you could just like this video right now, because that was, this will help to distrib distribute this video on YouTube because I'm streaming live 
all the likes I can get is always um, a handful, right? You know what I mean? So geometry subdivision, um, render polygons as subdiv, it will use catmull clock subdivision. And if I render now, it is now subdivided. And that's all you got to do. If you want a tighter, cleaner um, subdivision in render man, you would need to change the micro poly edge length. And I believe you do it on dicing, wherever dicing is. Let me see, dicing primva. So if you reduce this micro polygon length, closer to zero, um, you will get higher um, subdivision and it will be very clean. Uh, Random Man is a little bit different than Arnold. So in Arnold, you specify exactly how many subdiv steps you want, but Random Man does it kind of behind behind the scenes. All right, so now let's go into Rees and also um, open up the depth of field section. So I just clicked that, enabled that, and you can see we already have depth of field up and running. Um, it's maybe not as strong as you might think, but it is working very fast, especially if you use uh, the denoising function. Um, and then obviously you can go back to your camera, go to view and uh, change, where is it view? Is it sampling? Sampling and you can reduce the f-stop maybe to 0.1 and you will see that um, it gets very blurry. Obviously the, the typical stuff, right? of depth of field. A depth of field adds quite a lot of realism to your to your render. So I always encourage you, as, at least for personal projects, to render depth of field on a single frame. Obviously, if you render an animation, um, I would do it in compositing. Um, but for, for single frames, it's mainly recommended to get all the quality uh, you can get out of it. So rendering depth of field is always um, a good way of doing this. All right, so this is my focal point. So I probably want to have the focal point uh, right, right about here. And you can see it updates also in real time, which is quite nice. Um, all right, so let's go back to the Pixar surface base material. So this is what we have right now. It's just the typical Pixar surface shader. And on the Render Man documentation, there's lots of tons and stuff of it. So um, I will just briefly touching up on these things. Uh, let me see if I missed some uh, some questions. Uh, I never finished the African lady. I, I just uh, stopped at some point. Um, yeah, I know. Hey, Sana is going good. Let me just uh, grab some drink real quick. I'm not used to talking so much. All right, so how the Pixel Surface works, it has several different kind of lobes and different settings. It's, it's called an Uber shader. So there's lots of different things in it, right? You have your primaries, you have your rough specular, you have your clear coat, um, you've got your energy, energy conservation, you've got an iridescence, which is like a thin film effect. You've got your fuzz, which is um, sheen. In, uh, in, in Arnold, it's called sheen. Subsurface scattering, single scattering. Uh, I'm not sure what this is actually. Uh, oh, that's just the global settings. Then you've got your class presets and globes presets and global. So it's it has quite a lot in just that single shader. Typically what you want to do if you want to work with plastics and stuff, you, you pr pretty much just work with the fuse and um, the first specular lobe. It's like the principal shader. That's pretty pretty much what it is. Uh, but you can see like it has all, all sorts of different things. Um, also, let's uh, visualize our light. It's currently hidden. So on the pixel dome light, um, there is render this no wait where is it there pr and attributes camera visibility is turned off it's just this the uh, i'll just reflect you don't see too much anyways um, back to the shader so obviously you have your physical that's what uh, random man has it always has physical and artistic styles because um for artistic stuff you will break physicality quite fast but you have way more freedom um, but for the primary stuff, for instance, uh, you can have edge color, which is a measured uh, parameter. Uh, the cool thing is if you want to do metals, they have their own um, metallic workflow thing. And you just need to hook it up properly. But then this is essentially like a Disney um, BRDF. So if I go to diffuse and a primary spec and I hook these up to my diffuse color, um, I guess this one is um, edge color. And you hook it up like that. see if it works you need to enable metalness and then i think you need to be on artistic and then you have your metal so that's pretty nice so then you can obviously plug in you can go to substance painter and export your metallic workflow maps and plug it right in here and you will have a very good uh, metallic um, object just uh, with this little node here 
Um, yeah, so rough specular, right? That's a good question. Why would you use it if you have a default specular in it? And the reason is it's just ease of use, honestly. Um, you can, it's it's just a secondary lobe on top, a clear code or whatever. So you have essentially three specular lobes. Well, I'm actually not sure if, if the rough one and the primary one are in the same lobe. It is possible. Let's check. Uh, does it say which lobe it goes to? Typically they say which one it is. So this is a different specular model. Um, so edge color is on one, face color is zero. And then this is just the roughness of this material, right? And face color typically has always a little bit of a value, so you get this reflectance. And if I enable now, let's go physical here as well. Um, this will just um, enable you some kind of rougher material. It's as you can see, it's it's a lobe on top. So typically, you don't want if you want to model wood or paper, you probably just use the rough specular. But you could achieve the same result by just cranking up the roughness on the primary specular. So it's essentially the same thing, nothing too crazy. Um, but typically, I tend to just use the one and never touch um, the rough one, unless you need that control to have several different lobes. Um, and let's say you want to have a little bit of roughness in here. And then you obviously can do a clear coat, which is like the typical thing you always do. Um, it's just a very like polished look on top of everything, which gives you this nice kind of almost like a metallic feel to it. Um, like that, right? So that's now with the metallic, uh, with the clear coat on top. These are your energy conservation. And then again, you have your um, iridescence. If you want to have this um, thin film interference, that's pretty much a standard. Um, in Arnold, you have exactly the same thing, right? So nothing too crazy. Um, uh, peach fuzz is the sheen, which gives you like a like a white or a colorful sheen around the edges. So let's get rid of all the other stuff we just added. You can see now the sheen is happening on the 90 degree angles. You can change um, how strong it affects it. So it's pretty much uh, the same thing um, for this render engine as you have it on different ones. Uh, yes, I have worked with um, subsurface scattering as well. Uh, let's just default this out, default this out. So now we just have our basic one. Let's just um, also disable this one. And you can see now the sheen is working quite nicely. For subsurface scattering, you have uh, different lobe, uh, different kind of methods, right? So exponential path trace is the one I would recommend. This is the most accurate one. This is uh, similar to the one you would see in Arnold, which is um, a uh, what's it called um, random walk. It's not random walk, but it's, it's 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 at least a ray traced version of that. And then you have your distance the same way as you would have in um, in the other engines, right? So this is now your 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 distance. You can also crank it up if you want to see more of the effect or less. Let's go maybe a little bit darker here and increase the saturation. And you can see now we get this subsurface scattering look just by changing our a few parameters. And you obviously have all these on the on random man documentation. There's a lot of stuff in here which explains it quite nicely. You will see though that it is very very noisy, um, and takes a lot lots of samples to resolve this. So um, obviously you gotta um, optimize this quite heavily. Um, what else did I miss? Single scatter is just um, for kind of translucent paper effects. And then you have your glass, so glass, you just enable glass for refraction, uh, refraction and reflection. And then you have a transparent thing, you don't want to have any um, roughness. That is turned off, and then you have your glass object. And you also don't want any diffuse gain, and this is now your clear glass object. And these are the basic things you can do with uh, the Pixar Surface Shader, right? Obviously you can do um, all sorts of um, blending you can mix the materials like you would do in Arnold with the mix shader you can use uh, curvature nodes um, you can use all sorts of things right so you can just create a fractal noise and let's let's just get rid of the glass look here uh, the default to um, is control middle click control and mouse middle click or you right click it and say revert to uh, defaults um, wherever that is yeah revert to defaults um, so let's Go back up the gain. Let's maybe make a like a red plastic, right? So if I go to kind of like a red color, um, something like that, and then I go to my edge color. 
Why is this, uh... What is going on here? Oh, edge color needs to be on one, sorry. Um, so this is now my plastic material, let's say. Maybe it's a bit too pinkish. And you can see we are, we are constantly rendering with depth of field, right? So it is so fast, you can just leave it on and it's it's it doesn't really care too much about it, which is uh, super nice. So let's say we want to put in a, a breakup on my roughness, right? So typically the same thing I always do in Arnold, create a remap. It's called remap here, not range. It's the same thing though. So the result of my fractal goes into the input, the output of that goes into my specular roughness. The cool thing now, which I really love about this uh, random man integration, you can click that this little bug icon in Houdini and it will actually visualize you the map, which is something uh, Arnold should do as well. And now you can just quite easily just tweak it. Obviously, um, you can change your um, frequency, bumping that up, or you can plug in a 2D manifold, which is um, Pixar 2D manifold, which is just reading the UV per, um, um, attributes of the, of the object. And then you can obviously increase your frequency. Um, maybe not 100, maybe just 20. Uh, just 20. And then you have your breakup like that, right? So this is um, how you would apply UV coordinates to everything. And in the remap, you can see how fast it is. You just create nodes, hook it up, and it just kind of works pretty well. And then you can remap this. So whatever is black will have no roughness. Whatever is white will have full roughness. And then in the output range, you can specify what is the maximum of the white it should be. So you can say, oh, I just want a maximum output of white of, I don't know, 0.5 and my blacks should not be lower than 0.1 in terms of roughness. So you will always uh, clip the range, which is uh, very good. All right, so if I now disable the little debug icon, you will see that it is not connected to my shader. And because it's so, uh, you can see there's some kind of break up here. Maybe I should disable the depth of field for a little bit. Maybe this is a little bit more um, visible then. Also a nice thing, what you can do, you can hit three and it in the image tool, you can drag a region, hit R and it will only update that region. It's like a region render. You can also say um, auto crop render. So if I move it now, it will always update that specific region. Uh, pretty nice. Um, a cool thing which uh, Random Man has, it's called um, Bump Roughness, which is a new technology they developed for cars. And what that is doing, it gives you a little bit more detail in the bump and in the roughness um, uh, material. So I can, for instance, if I just um, load up a texture, um, let me just go into my acid library here and jump to textures and load up, uh, which one should I load? Maybe this one. And then I'm just looking for some kind of uh, scratch masks or something. Maybe this one. Just double clicking it brings it into the scene. And what you want to do though, um, you want to create a bump to roughness node, and then you want to plug in that file path actually. It works a little bit different. So you just uh, plug this map in here and delete it actually from here. And you just specify what input texture this is. And we just want to say it's a data map. And then in the texture manager from Random Man, which you can bring up by hitting a plus going down here to Random Man and load up the texture manager. You can parse the scene and it will find our map. You make sure you enable bump rough as a bump map and then it will convert that. Uh, it takes a little bit of time. I think you've got to hit apply actually to get it up and running. And then it's processing that and then this texture map is converted to a bump roughness map, which is pretty nice. You need to hook it up a little bit differently as well. So once that is done, um, what is also nice, the question about uh, XML data, RenderMan24 has a new thing which is called uh, live statistics. And this is actually um, loading the current statistics of the current render into the scene. I'm not sure why it errored out. Maybe we got some kind of information. No, we don't get a, maybe I need to stop it and re restart the render. Oh, well, I'm not even sure if it works with um, IPR sessions. Oh, it does. Okay. And this is now hooked up to my live render session. And you can directly see now 
um, what this render is using up. So time to first pixel, um, 0.7 seconds, first ray, whatever that means. Um, and you get hot, like a breakdown of how much time the lighting took, how much time the ray tracing took, and you can see everything in one thing. You can change your different uh, debug levels here to get more information. So that is uh, pretty handy as well. So the bump roughness map has been converted, I think. Let's just uh, disconnect it. I'm not sure what the, the texture hit is. So this is converted now. Let's just move this back over. And what this wants to do, you want to, this wants to be connected to bump maps to, um, I'm not sure what result N is, and result normal geometry, I guess. Yeah. So you want to hook it up properly. So this is the result in roughness. Um, and this one goes into specular roughness like that. Then you have specular anisotropy. And you do have your, right, this is uh, result anisotropy. And this is probably the direction. So this goes into the anisotropy direction. And then result N goes into global bump. And now you can start to see, we get this really fine detail. And this is driven by the specular bump roughness map. And obviously you can combine your previous maps with this. So if I just move this out of the side here and I go maybe um, a blend or a mix or multiply. So they have this arith arithmetic. I'm not sure what, how you would pronounce it, but you have all these operations. So you can do additive operations. So this, um, you just can combine, let's say this channel uh, with this one here, Oops, I'm not sure why it's failing. I guess it wants to have... I'm not sure if it needs to be um, RGB. You also have Bump Mixer, which is all oh, Pixar Mix. What does Pixar Mix do? Um, this is probably just a lerp operation, so I guess... What happens if we do this? Does it complain again? No, so this might work. Specular roughness. Let's just see uh, if this actually does blend. Yeah, so this blends your two maps together as well. So that's pretty nice. You can just do that. And so this is now doing the pixel roughness, uh, bump to roughness workflow. And you will see that obviously it's a bit noisy, but you will see all the details. And again, you can play all, with all sorts of things. You can disable normal mapping and you can just um, increase the roughness, for instance, um, base roughness will break it up. And you can see now we get this micro detail and depending on how far you're away from the camera, this is pretty much um, the detail you will get. Um, Render Man always, always, always works with uh, TEX files. There is no exception, like every file will be converted. Um, one sec, my phone is ringing here. Um, and you can control it like that. So that is pretty nice. Obviously, uh, unfortunately, this uh, pixel bump roughness does not work, I think, with XPU just yet, but we can actually test it. So if I stop the render now and I go to my RIS and I just switch it from uh, RIS to XPU, this will now be using my um, GPU uh, when I render. Hopefully that is um, working. I'm not sure if bump to roughness is supported, so we might see a crash. Let's see. So GPUs are loading up. Yeah, I totally agree that um, Render Man is better better integrated into um, into this. So this is now running on XPU, which is just GPU plus CPU. Um, one thing which doesn't work in in the image tool is you do not have denoising, um, which you have on just RIS. But this is, you can see, this is pretty fast. This is um, running now on the GPU. And you can see, actually, bump to roughness is working just fine. Um, I think my output settings are very low, so I'm not really doing uh, lots of sampling. So let's just increase my max samples. So now this will take a little bit longer to resolve. Um, but then it will, you can already see now, this is uh, working pretty well and it's cleaned up. Um, I do like to use RIS. For now because it has the built-in denoising which i like so i'm just switching it back but essentially you just switch it over and it, it runs on your gpus instead you can see this is um this is significantly slower 
but it's again you have the the denoising. Uh, you'll be working on <laughs> picks up blend. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not 100% like too familiar with all the notes. I looked through them and there's tons of them, but probably blend sounds uh, very much the same. And yeah, this this is just blending between my, so you can mix it with a texture and use um, different blending operations. So yeah, you can totally use Pixar Blend as well. And the cool thing now it also has like uh, the dirt, which is called uh, it's a, it's essentially occlusion, uh, which you can now use to do like a color correction based on that. So uh, my this is my base color, and I could use now the similar how I would do it in in Arnold. You kind of have your Pixar color correct nodes. Let me just copy this uh, red tone here. Copy parameter. I uh, just render this region. And I paste this color into my input color, paste value, hook that up into my diffuse color. So no change here. Um, but I can now specify a mask, which would be my dirt. So if I plug that in here and I can visualize the dirt, this is now the occlusion. And you can change your, um, where is it? Your distance somewhere max distance you can specify that here i'm not sure why okay i'm just on a very small scale yeah i would say uh, you're quite right like I, I i feel like compared compared to the arnold integration in houdini random integration into houdini feels very good um, but Random Man is integrated equally well in all the DCCs. At least that's um, based on my experience. So there's no, no big difference there. Um, so the value here is 0 0.2. We probably want to push it more. So I'm just connecting a remap in between here. So the input of the dirt goes into my remap. The output goes into my mask. So, so now I'm v uh, visualizing the debug of the remap. So now I can uh, crank up my, my whites. So this is uh, fully white. And if I now want to visualize what the color correct node is doing, I can now go into color correction. And for instance, I can gamma it down to make it a little bit darker on these regions. And this is essentially the same thing. And it, it works equally well. You can use curvature, you can use um, occlusion, or it's called dirt mapping in here. And then you have everything uh, baked in. You can see now we got the darker areas at the bottom, top and bottom there. Uh, yes, so ACES is really well integrated. It does everything on the fly, which is very nice. Um, so in the texture manager, you will see at the bottom you have your color spaces, and these are ACES color spaces. So it only has um, a data, which is raw. It has your rendering space, which, which is ACES CG. It has texture space, which is sRGB, and it has sRGB linear. So that's the four you have. You can obviously add your own if you adjust the, the config file uh, yourself, but they will all automatically go into ACES CG and it will convert that for you on the fly. And at the bottom, you will see that it will actually um, append suffixes to your files. It will say lin underscore ACES CG, or it will say B2R for bump to roughness. And all these things are done behind the scenes automatically on the fly. And you don't need to worry about it pretty much. Um, and then obviously you have your typical other workflows, like you can do your Pixar, um, Pixar mix, um, what's it called? I think Pixar layer and then Pixar standard, uh, Pixar layer mixer. So they have all, all sorts of different things. Um, so you can definitely mix different layers together if you use a Pixar layer material instead. So that's also something uh, to, this is a different workflow. You have like a you can stack different pixel layer materials, but you need to use a different kind of pixel shader to do this because it uses um, a kind of pass through mode to control global parameters versus local parameters. So it's a little bit different, but I will do a dedicated video just on on pixel layers. Um, next, up, what I was talking about was the llama. I think that's why most of you guys are watching. So you have this new llama stuff, right? So what is that? It's called a, it's, it's a llama material. Uh, it's a layered material developed by Industrial Light and Magic. And it's now part of Render Man. And the difference of this is in, in the Pixar surface shader, you will see that you have your diffuse lobe. You've got your primary lobes, roughness lobes, clear coat, all the different things. 
Um, and you don't have that in Llama. Llama is essentially a Lego brick and you have your base four tile Lego. You put something on top, which is, I don't know, a different Lego brick and you, you can create your own shaders like that. So you have your diffuse lobe, you have your specular lobes, you have your scattering lobes, you've got your sheen lobes and you can stack them however you please. I'm not sure if you can hear that, but my water bottle is making some nice uh, bird sounds. Um, anyway, so how do you start? You create a llama diffuse and you hook it up to your BRDF output. And if I hit render now, uh, we have llama. That's all we have to do. And the default again is 18%. So that's a default uh, neutral gray shading ball. Pretty epic stuff, right? So um, that's all you have to know about llama. No, I'm kidding. So, um, Obviously now this is uh, the first the first step, right? Most of the materials you see out there are, um, are diffuse materials or are dielectric, so you will have a diffuse component to them. Obviously you can change your colors and do all sorts of funky things with this. And let's say we want to add a spec lobe, right? So um, what would you do? You want to create a spec lobe, so you want to go to Llama um, Dielectric, right? So this is your spec lobe. Um, so let's hook it up, what happens? Does something happen? Does it update? CPU is on full blast. Let's just hit uh, re-render. And now you can see, oh, what the hell? Now is this a glass material? But this is expected. If you just hook up a dielectric, this will be treated as a glass surface. And this is how you would model glass. You have your, um, you still have that dispersion, which is now like a diamond material or whatever. You have your interior stuff with absorption. So you can create a foggy glass look or all these kinds of things just within this dielectric. So that's pretty good stuff. But how do you combine a diffuse and a dielectric, right? So there is uh, different ways of doing this. So the best one is to use a llama, um, I, I believe I mix them up. I think you want to have a llama layer for this. Yeah. So llama layer is how do you stack different lobes together? And it's always bottom and top layer. And for a plastic, you have your diffuse and then you have your code on top, which is um, <laughs> you, you diffuse and then you have obviously your specular on top. So material base, let me zoom in here as much as I can. Material base, this is where your llama diffuse will hook up to. Actually, let me change my uh, res quick here to have a very low variance so we have a bit faster um, renders here. And also, before we jump in, I want to go to, uh, what is it, limits, I guess. Uh, where is it? Rendering. It's always somewhere else. Uh, let's see, render limits, threads. Uh, it's 60. I just want to have a few resources for my system here. All right, so if I render now, we get everything as we had. So let's hook up the BXDF again. You can see Llama is not really updating as nicely as it was with Pixar Surface. So you always need to restart the render to actually um, see these updates. But now if I ho uh, hook up the Llama Dielectric to the top, you will see, oh, we got a click code, uh, or at least we got a specular lobe. And you can um, specify the lobe name. So this will go into the specular lobe. You can create all sorts of custom names for your things here. And this will drive into um, the AOVs or LPs you output later on for compositing. Um, so let's say we want a rough material, right? So this is now my rough plastic, similar as we did before. So how would you do a clear code, right? And the cool thing now is you can be as crazy as you want to be, right? So you can duplicate the llama later one more time, um, put that into the base, and you can create another specular component, call this maybe specular clear, and hook that up into your top material, and then hook it up to your BXDF output, and change the roughness. And you will now see that it is energy conserving because it is not additive. It's not adding the previous um, um, brightness, but you now have a clear code on top. And if I change the roughness, you will see that both layers are in here. And based on the layer mode, you can add or see how much it will um, be added to it. So um, what is it, rough coding? I'm not sure exactly what these things do. I need to, um, yeah, so this is what you want for nail blending. And now you can see we have your two lobes on top of each other. So that's my rough lobe and this is my clear code on top, right? So um, this is then essentially how you would model different kind of specularities on top of each other. 
And you, you kind of can create your own Uber shader with this, right? So you can do all sorts of advanced materials. Let me just uh, delete these two guys, lava layer. Uh, this is again our regular clear code. And if there, then there's also the option, there's like a llama surface. And what this is doing, it's essentially a global control. And you can have like, if you have two different objects with, with two surfaces, like one side is red, the other one is blue, whatever, you can use uh, front and back materials. Um, but the BXDF just connects, I guess, to the front. And then if you hook it up here, you shouldn't see any difference. It's still the same material, but now you have like a global control of things. So you can actually disable um, subsurface scattering, you can disable or enable interior and all that. So you have more like a global control of things. Um, so what else can we do? Obviously you have subsurface scattering, which you could um, use instead of the diffuse component. So if I plug that in here in my base, you will see it kind of disable it because our global subsurface is off. So make sure you enable global subsurface scattering. And then let's see, we need to um, specify, I guess, a few colors here. So this is now my subsurface color. You can change the scale, like how much does it uh, penetrate? You can see now it actually bleeds nicely through everything. Um, and if I go back to the globals and disable scattering, you will see it's off. If I turn it back on, this is on, right? So that's like a global control. Uh, let me see. Laura is asking, why not use a standard shader though? Wouldn't the output be the same most of the time? Or yeah, so the why would you use Llama, right? And you would use Llama in a very controlled production environment if you need very, very specific needs, right? So you can create all sorts of custom materials which which might not be supported in a surface material, right? So the surface stat the Pixar surface has its kind of own building block set up and it just works this and that way. Sometimes you don't need all this jazz. You don't need this really um, exp like convoluted shader. Sometimes you just need a diffuse lobe. Why do you need all this um, access material? So then you can just create your own llama diffuse and it will be probably a lot faster, right? And, and that is the main reason. And in production, there are all sorts of different needs for, I don't know, specific um, skin materials, which has um, three bump maps and which has a micro bump slot and all these things are not default in a Pixar surface shader. So that's why you would use Llama to create your complex custom ones. Um, and you can only kind of art direct it to your own needs, right? So let me first check what's going on here. Um, and then again, you have um, all the, you've got your hair shader, Llama Hair Chang is like a hair shader. You've got Llama Emission, conductors for metals, obviously. And it kind of works all the same way, right? So if you have just your conductor material here, let's just render. That's your gold input, right? I'm not sure if they have presets. Uh, they don't, but this is now a default gold material. And you can get these colors from all sorts of websites. I think the um, um, PBR guide has a few of those uh, colors you need to enter and these are measured values for srgb color space i think and again you can do all sorts of things if you want to have a clear coat you just put that into your base here material base this goes into shader one now so now if i render this again you will now or well, we should now see let's see this is the top we should have um this clear coat i'm not sure why we don't see it I think now we see this. As I said, I'm not fully sure about um, these layer modes. I need to read up on those as well in a bit more detail. And then you also have Llama Mix, which is uh, mixing different kind of um, lobes or materials together. So that's also something you can do. But you can see this is now nice and glossy here. Uh, what I didn't actually do is um, I didn't set up any AOV. So you can go to wrists and you can go to images extra image planes, and you can load up a few um, of your lighting ones. So you probably want direct spec, indirect diffuse, indirect spec, uh, direct diffuse, what else? And then you have all your crazy layers here, which we don't want really. A uh, cool one is diagnostic, and you can use a sample count to actually see how much samples are being used at, at the right time. Mats is custom ones. You can use your shadow passes, shadow mats, which are nice for compositing. 
But right now, again, you should now see, um, if I had C for my catalog, um, this is my sample count, AOV, specular, indirect spec, all sorts of things. And you can see now if I hover, you can see which takes the most samples. And we are here now at 87 samples versus uh, five samples. So this is very fast to render the outside here. But once it gets bouncing all around, this will be ex uh, obviously way more expensive. And this is a nice way to see why you need to optimize your shaders. And then I yesterday I was doing something for fun, testing um, um, volumes and attribute transfers. Oh, why is this not loading? One sec, I'm not sure why it's not loading. Uh, yeah, I'm just loading this up. It was quite fun, quick test to um, do some rendering here. Oh, I actually don't know where I did save it. Did I save it here? Yeah, I think this is the one. So you can also render, you can automatically denoise it as well. So you can render it and then just run a denoise pass as well. So your renders will always be, you will have the raw render and you will always have the denoise render, which is also quite nice. Yeah, so this, this I was I was doing this on my Discord server. Um, I was streaming it over there just to test it. Obviously, it's very flickery, and I need to do a V two like a second iteration. But essentially, the idea is um, the fire is hitting the pot. It's starting to glow, um, and then it starts to let off some steam. You can see it. It's obviously covered in flame. So this was just my first whip render, and the flickering is really annoying. Um, but that was the idea. And this rendered like, I think, five frames a minute. So this was uh, pretty fast to render this. Um, what else can I show you? Uh, any questions, um, pop them in the chat, please. I just wanted to give you a quick insight of um, how you would set up Llama networks and Pixar Surface networks. And about render settings, it's very similar, at least for the um, for the Pixar Path Tracer. Render settings are very similar to Arnold's adaptive sampling. So you specify your maximum, you specify your minimum, and then it's all driven by this pixel variance here. So my maximum right now is 512. Um, but it's controlled by the variance. So if the noise is very high, um, it will sometimes at some level just cut off and it will not calculate more. Um, yeah, the, uh, the 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 pot is getting hotter by the fire. Yeah, so whenever the fire touches the the object, it will start to glow. So that's how I set it up. Um, yeah, so this is now 92 samples, and if I just render maybe um, this region here, and if I lower the um, the pixel variance maybe to one, you will see that we get way more samples. If I go even lower, let's say point zero five you will now see that we get a lot more samples here and everything gets brighter. And this will give you a way cleaner result. You can see it's uh, very clean now. It's still rendering, but it is very clean. There's just some noise down here and this will just resolve after some time. Um, the other cool thing is you don't always need to render incrementally. So you can also obviously disable that and see the final bucket renders, which is sometimes I do all the time. So. Um, I go up here and uh, if I hit IPR now, oops, that's not the right one. If I go to my, um, where is it? Was it up here? Preview render? Yeah, so if you go pre preview render, you will see your final um, buckets. Uh, you said we could get Llama custom passes and AOVs. Um, yeah, you obviously need to do some LPE scripting for that, which is not, uh, which is probably not in the scope of this video. But you can obviously just stop this render here. Does it stop now? Yeah. Uh, you can obviously go into um, into images and you can create your own custom output. So you can just hit um, the plus here, and you can create your own uh, custom your custom Im image planes here. So this is now your custom LPE. 
and you can read different kind of um, lobes from the llama and if you specify a lobe name in here like some kind of specular in my specular um, you can just read that as well into in that but again this is obviously out of the scope because this is just an introduction one but this is how you would kind of you specify the lobe names in here and then in your res um, you can read them in here and output them directly But again, this is more pipeline oriented and very production um, sense. So you would need to, it, obviously you would only create them if you really need them for your needs. Uh, the questions about faster renders, I honestly, I don't want to talk about this anymore. Like for me, there is no faster render really. They all have pros and cons. Sometimes you do this, sometimes you do that. So it's always uh, a little bit different of what, you, what your use case is, right? So if you want to use caustics, obviously go for random man or v-ray or something but if you want to go for outdoor rendering scenes you probably want to go with arnold because it's just super fast for outdoor scenes um it just depends right I i'm pretty sure all render engines out there today can all deliver amazing quality and a good good results um i can also quickly show you how i set up the fire scene if anyone is interested uh, project selector. Yeah, so and if you if you are not on the Discord server yet, it's a great time to jump on the Discord server. We are um, growing pretty fast. We do have lots of um, experienced people on the server. Everyone is very helpful. You can learn Random Man, you can learn Arnold, V-Ray, Max, Maya, Blender. Everything is out there, so check it out as well. Um, let me quickly give you a quick breakdown of how I set up the, the teapot scene, right? So obviously I do have my teapot, teapot here. Uh, let's see, hi, edit this. So I'm bringing him in. I'm subdividing him here. I'm not doing it on render time because I need the higher quality for my simulation stuff. Um, this is the attribute transfer, which is actually transferring this um, fire from the simulation. You can see now when it's hitting it, um, whatever is red is hot. And this is, I'm using this uh, to drive my shader. Right? Obviously, I need to run this through a solver. So it's uh, very slow and it's fading in and out. Right now, it's directly when it's touching, it's changing, which is not how it would work because the conductor would. Um, like the heat would travel through the medium and it will not just go on and off. So that's something I would need to do in my V2. Um, that's all for the teapot. And then I um, created this steam. What I did here, I just have a little sphere. I have my Axiom solver, which is a third party render, uh, which is a third party um, fluid simulation, fluid simulator. And then all I'm doing here is I'm just outputting this little steam thing. Nothing crazy, quite straightforward. Um, it just has some um, disturbance, some turbulences, and that's all it has to create this basic steam of wind. And then for the fire, pretty similar. I'm starting out with a point velocity. I'm creating my particle stream based on that. Let me just go to the start here. This is my particle stream, which is emitting temperature and fuel. The fuel is then used um, to create a VDB field, and this is then piped into the Axiom solver. If I visualize the solver and I bake it, and if I play, this is now simulating in uh, six frames per second. So it's pretty fast solving. And this is now hitting my collider, collision object, and it's creating a nice vortex all around it. Obviously, you can crank up your simulation quality by going lower on the subdivs, um, on the division size, which will give you more details, which I didn't do. Um, I will probably will need to do that. But you can see now sim times are a lot longer, but you get a higher resolution simulation, right? Um, and then I just cached it out to disk and I use that again. So this is in the end, in, in turn driving my heat transfer, right? So this is the simulation, this is the sim, sim um, fire sim. 
And you can see it's wrapping around the teapot here quite nicely. And then the flame source gets a material called Pyro, which I just renamed to Pyro. And all it's doing is it's reading the density field and it's reading the temperature field. And it's actually, I have this connected velocity. It also has the velocity field, which is driving the motion blur of the volume. Temperature, I'm remapping it. So it's a little bit tighter. So I have a bit more smoke. I'm multiplying the emission intensity by 100, so I get a nice, hot and bright flame. And this goes into the pixel volume shader. I have multiple scattering enabled, which means that the light will bounce within the medium and bounce off in the light, in the smoke. Um, and then the steam has the most basic shader, just a density read and a color for the smoke. The, P the teapot here for the um, heat transfers reading in this attribute called heat, which I created in the teapot where I'm transferring it over. And the heat is then driving the diffuse color, it is driving the specular roughness, and it is driving the um, irid the iridescence, which I have around it. So it is this kind of heat effect, you can see that it gets a little bit distorted and red, and this is driven by um, this iridescence effect. Uh, what else can we do here? Yeah, and then obviously I just uh, went to the render output here. So if I go to out, this is my renderer itself, where I specify the frame ranges. EXR is my output, then I have my denoiser. Uh, it's important that you go node by node in the order, so it will render one frame, then it will denoise, one frame, denoise, one frame, denoise. Uh, my camera died, huh? I, I'm not sure actually when it died. <laughs> Probably a while back, huh? Um, anyways, is it back now? Yeah, there we go. Um, anyway, so um, this, I just wanted to give you a quick introduction on Random Man. As you might think, I will be doing more Random Man tutorials quite soon, which will be similar to my Arnold ones, um, but production ready assets. I will do more high quality shading stuff. And again, if you want to see all that, make sure to subscribe to my channel. Um, I'm uploading mostly once a week, a tutorial. Sometimes I do streams on weekends. So make sure to follow me on my social media pages as well, like Instagram and all that stuff. Um, Instagram is actually where I always post my rendered results, which is also quite nice. And yeah, I think that's all I wanted to show for my Sunday afternoon. I will be heading out now, meeting a, a friend of mine. Um, we probably have dinner or something. So uh, not dinner, but lunch. So uh, enjoy your week, have a good start, and I will see you in the next tutorial or in the next live stream. So thanks everyone for watching.